Hello, welcome to session number nine. So glad you're still with us. And hopefully these skills and a lot of them are coming together. So yeah, you know, I like to think a lot of it, like if you've ever seen the movie Karate Kid and you know, the first one when Daniel first meets Mr. Miyagi and wants to learn some karate and you know, he has them waxing the floors or I'm sorry, uh, painting the fences, um, sanding floors, uh, waxing his cars. And, you know, day and night he's doing that and he just kind of gets frustrated and gives up. And then Mr. Miyagi shows him like when he's actually using these motions that he's been doing over and over and over again for days. He's learning different blocking techniques and hitting techniques and has actually gotten the pieces of the puzzle that he just needed to be able to put together. So, so a lot of this, hopefully you're starting to see these pieces and how some of them fit together and make you feel better. And uh, so the skill for this week for session nine is uh, one of my favorites. Um, well, <laughs> I say that is about all of them, but I do hear like a lot of people, this is a very, very quick one and a very, very easy one to do anytime, any place. Um, now, now I, think, I think in your notebook, unless when you're listening to this, if it's a little bit later on and uh, the notebook's been changed, but I believe it says toe tapping, that one actually comes a little bit later. Uh, so, so this one is called balloon float. So, so if you want to scratch it out, put in balloon float, or if you're doing electronically, just in parentheses, put the correct name. Um, it, it's, it's a great technique. And uh, it, it's, again, a short one. So, so we'll go to the short video, and I'll catch up with you here in just one minute. Hey everyone. It's Mike again. I uh, hope, hope the worry time has been productive for you and helpful. And you're, you, the what if thinking thing and you're the better but believable thoughts that everything's starting to come together. And, you know, we talked about at the beginning, there, there may be a period where you actually feel a little worse as you're trying these new things. But you know, now that we've done eight, nine weeks, um, hopefully you're starting to, th th this should be where the upswing starts and your brain's getting used to these new things and they're more productive, more positive, and you're starting to feel better. So for this skill today, it's just called the balloon. There used to be an app called Worry Float that I would use with kids. I don't even think it exists anymore, but the whole thing is whatever your worry is, you're gonna breathe it into a balloon. Um, so, so just imagine you know, you're worried about an upcoming job interview. So you just pretend you're blowing up a balloon and inside that balloon, you're putting that worry. So that job interview, tie the balloon up and just release it. And in, in the worry app, you would actually, you would type in what your worry is. And then on the phone, it would just show you that balloon floating away, getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and it would just disappear in the clouds, All right? But what, what I want you to do, you put it in a balloon, just in your imagination, see it float away. You know, for me, I watch it go up into the clouds and right up into the hands of Jesus, which is way better than in my hands. But the big thing is just, just watch that balloon, put the worry in, um, just watch it float away, go up into the clouds and allow it to release from you. Okay, so great short technique. Give it a try and hopefully it's one that works for you. So again, you know, another great skill to try. Um, it, it definitely, you know, when there's something heavy on your heart uh, to be able to just with, with your imagination, blow it into the balloon and let it float upright to Jesus. Um, you, you know, I, I actually got this, um, like listening and watching, uh, you know, some techniques with kids who have lost somebody very close to them, you know, so they go to some grief camps and, you know, they'll, they'll write a letter to their loved one in heaven, attach it to a balloon, um, e even for people who regret having abortions, um, that, that they, one of the techniques they use is they'll have them write a letter to the baby who is in heaven and attach it to a balloon and send it up. And it's like, you know, like God has given us access to, to send any request to him and cares deeply and loves us so much that, you know, we never bother him. Nothing's ever too big or too little for him to handle. And it's something we can definitely uh, send to him at any time. And I did want to show you, I mentioned in that video, uh, the worry float, it actually does still exist. So, so, so here's my phone. You can see a little icon with the sun on it. That's the worry float. Um, so it, it just brings up the picture of a balloon. 
And I think it says, um, what's your worry? So you just tap on the balloon and it allows you to type in whatever that you are worried about. I don't know why it's not coming up. There we go. Um, so, so let's just say you have a job interview coming up and you're worried about it. So I'll type in interview. You can see it. I don't know how clear that's coming through, but there's the word interview inside the balloon. I just hit the let it go. Um, and then when I'm ready, the clouds come up, just release. And you can see that worry, that stress, that anxiety, just get smaller and smaller and smaller and float away to the clouds until it's gone. And it's not enough, a worry that you need to continue to carry around. So, you know, you know, I like the image of giving it to God or, you know, sending that worry to Jesus more than just watching it disappear. But, you know, if your imagination isn't strong, I'm sure with all the stuff you've been practicing and doing, it's getting better. But if you need that image of those sort of things, or like I said, if, if you have children, grandkids, or something that's dealing with some anxiety and worry and those sort of things, it's a great thing for kids that they can actually see it and visualize it. And I think it's next session, you know, another powerful technique that I come up with um, with some obsessive thinking um, that, that I had used with a child that had tremendous results. Um, so, so you can look forward to that in session 10. But today we're, we're focusing, uh, our, our main topic is guilt, but we're also gonna talk a little bit more about worry and ho hopefully the uh, the worry jar or the worry container has been extremely productive for you and you've seen your worry cut down and that you've just been worrying your heart out for the last week or two or however long it's been since the last session. And one of the things that we're going to do today is make that worry time so much more effective and meaningful. And, you know, rather than just worrying your heart out, um, it, it's going to be a healthier exercise. Um, but your goal over the last week or two was to just catch those worries, put it in your container and being able to open that container at a scheduled time. And so, so ho hopefully you've gotten at least moving in that direction. Again, the, you know, some of you have been worrying for 30 years, 40 years, and you become really professional worriers. You know, if there was a, if worrying was a major league sport, you know, you may be the highest paid player. Like I, I've been there, totally understand that. So, so some, sometimes that habit, you know, takes just a little bit longer, but keep up with it and, and don't give up. Uh, but with guilt, we'll look at point number one there. Guilt is an emotion that puts you in the past. All right. So some of the thoughts that people have when they say like, you know, I'm, I'm full of guilt, struggling with guilt. Number one, you know, I'm a bad person. Um, and, and you know what? According to the Bible, that that's true. You know, no one is righteous, not even one that comes out of the book of Romans. So another thing people think is I did something wrong. Um, again, out of the book of Romans. That, that's a true statement. Um, all of sin and fall short of God's glory. Um, and, and then another thought, like, I, I should be punished for what I did. And you know what? Romans 6.23 tells us the wages of sin is death and our mistakes, they do deserve punishment. But the, the gospel message, gospel stands for good news. Um, you know, John 3.16, that God loved us so much. We talked about this, you know, back in the spiritual disciplines lesson that he sent Jesus to die on a cross not so that we would live in this state of guilt and this state of feeling bad, but he died so we can have life and have um, life abundantly. Uh, that, that comes from John 10.10. 10. And uh, so, so, you know, God doesn't want us to live in this state of guilt. So even though all those thoughts are true, that we are imperfect, we do bad things, um, that, that we deserve punishment and those sort of things, God loved us enough that he sent Jesus to die on a cross for us and give us that abundant life. And, you know, Jesus didn't die on a cross for us to live in a state of guilt. You know, he wants us to live in a state of victory. And Romans 8, 1 there says there's now no condemnation. Um, and, and that, again, Jesus didn't die for us to stay in that state of guilt. All right, so what do we do about it? So number two, you need to confront your guilt. So this is going to be a great little kind of like a little chart to refer to. So anytime you feel guilty or have guilty feelings creep in, this is something to just refer to uh, that may be able to help you. All right, so, so you're gonna ask yourself these questions. So question number one, did you do it on purpose? 
So, so maybe you did it out of anger, maybe you did it out of frustration, maybe you did it to avoid a punishment, maybe you, know, maybe you made a mistake that you knew you would get in trouble for. Um, so, so if that's the case, you make amends. Um, you, you know, so if you broke something, replace it. You need to apologize to somebody, apologize. Um, just, just own up to what you did. And like, I don't think that there, there's nobody walking this earth that assumes that everybody is a perfect person and you know if anything it's probably gonna allow them to even give you like more respect and greater appreciation you know for somebody to walk up and say you know what i'm, I'm sorry i really blew it and will you forgive me um now again you only have control over yourself and there are those hurt people who hurt people that you know some people you approach and try and apologize and they'll just walk all over you and make you feel worse and those sort of things. But again, all you can do is control what you say, what you do. And if you feel guilty, apologize for it, make amends for it and move on. You can't control what that other person says or does. All right, so the second thing, you know, was it an accident? Uh, you know, one of my favorite stories from my dad, and it's been a long time since he's told this, but, but I remember him talking about a story where he was saving up as a little kid to buy a model airplane. And there, there was a little store at the end of his street that sold groceries and had a little toy section and those sort of things. So he knew how much it cost and he was saving and saving. And he would go down to the, the store with his mom to get groceries and stuff. And the store was owned by an older couple and they were normally in the back stocking shelves, going through inventory, whatnot. So they, they would go up to check out and nobody would be at the checkout place. And they'd wait and they'd wait and they'd wait. My dad said my grandma, his mom, would always say something to the effect of, I bet if we walked out the door, they'd get up here in a hurry. And uh, so they, they would always wait and eventually somebody would come up and check them out. But, you know, after a long time of saving money, dad finally got the money for the model rocket and went, picked it up off the shelf, went up to the front to check out. And of course the older couple was back in the back, you know, going through inventory or whatever they do back in the back. And he's waiting and he's waiting and nobody comes up and he remembers what his mom would always say. I bet if I walked out of the store, they get up here in a hurry. So my dad walks out of the store and just kind of waits by the door, looking in, waiting for somebody to hurry up and get up front and nobody ever came. So my, my dad walked home with his model rocket, happy as can be, like no, I, no concept or clue in the world that he had just stolen this plane and couldn't wait to tell my grandma, his mom, like what happened and how wonderful this was. And, I, you know, I did what you said, like I walked out of the store so they would come up to check me out and they never came up. So look, I got my model airplane. I still got all my money. And my, my grandma just got extremely upset, walked them back to the store, made them give the airplane back, made them pay for the model airplane. And all in the meantime, like my dad, like, had no idea like what was going on, what exactly he had done wrong. You know, in, in his mind, he was just following what my grandma had said. And uh, so that would be the perfect example of, hey, this is just an accident. And I remember one time somebody in my church, you know, came across an old high school friend. Uh, I think it was at Walmart or, you know, one of the big stores. And th this guy was kind of like the class clown and always joking around about everything. And it, it wasn't somebody like you saw all that often, you know, just kind of a, a little bit more of an acquaintance, but not really a close friend and, and had seen him in the store. And, you know, I don't remember his name, but said something like, hey, Chuck, how you doing? And Chuck looks back at him and said, well, he's like, I'm dying. And, uh, my, the, you know, the guy from my church was like, oh, OK, that, you know, good for you. <laughs> you, you know, laughing about it, thinking that, you know, here's the jokester. He always makes cracks like this. And didn't think much of it and literally within just a couple of weeks there he was in the obituaries he had some type of aggressive cancer that took him like really really quickly and he was just riddled with guilt like I can't believe I said that I can't believe um but in, in reality he didn't do that in a hurtful way um he, he, he it was completely by accident so the story of my dad the story of the guy at the church you know a, a lot of times we, we just do things without even realizing, and we feel guilty about those. So in the blank there, you know, when it's an accident, you know, give yourself some grace and just say, you know what, we all, we all make mistakes um, and, and that nobody's perfect. 
uh, and you know, j just being able to move on. Now, again, if you feel guilty and need to make some type of amends, you know, feel free. You know, so, so, so if I say something that I later realized was insensitive or something like that, and I really didn't mean it, like I can still go and apologize to that person and, you know, let, let them know, like, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, like I, I really didn't mean to come across this way or, you know, I, I didn't mean for this to offend you. Um, and, and, you know, even though it was an accident, like you can still, if you really feel like you need to make amends, you can still do that. All right. The next question, you know, how, how terrible was it? And, you know, most of the time, like, like what we deem as we had done something terrible, uh, kind of when, when it boils down, like it's normally not as bad as you think it actually was. So I, I remember, I'm going to say I was maybe 13. I might not even have been that old. Um, but we me, me and my friend from down the street were, uh, it was summertime and we were doing Roman candles. So it's kind of like a long firework on a stick and you light them and they shoot these fireballs out and we're kind of like shooting them at each other. And my dad was always big into hunting. So, so he had an archery range in the backyard and I'm, you know, I'm trying to shoot my friend from down the street and uh, he's kind of hiding behind this archery range and this fireball goes and it hits my dad's hay bales that he, he shoots archery at. And, and so this archery range starts on fire. And so, so we go down there and we're trying to kick it and knock it out, but it just got like beyond our control. So I ran in my house and was going to call 911. And I picked up the phone and having a teenage sister, she was on it chatting with her friends. I was like, get off, hang up, hang up. We got, there's an emergency. And she's just like yelling at me, just like the annoying little brother. Uh, so we ran across the street to my grandma's house and she was 99% of the time home. And this was the one time her door was locked <laughs> and nobody was there. So we ran down to my, my friend's house telling him, we got to call 911. We got to call. And, you know, his mom was like, what, what are you talking about? And wouldn't would give us the phone. And then she looked out the window and saw like spoke, like just billowing, like from up the street where my house was. So finally got to call 911 and all the fire trucks came. And in the meantime, somehow like word got to my dad. And so, so he came and, you know, so fire departments putting this out and, and behind my house, there was an alley uh, that went right past like where this hay bale and stuff was that my dad would shoot at. And uh, so, so I remember, you know, my dad talking to one of the firemen and the, fi you know, my, my dad said something like, you know, how, how do you think this fire started? And the fireman said, uh, you know, somebody was probably driving down the alley and threw a cigarette out the window. And that's what started it. And I remember hearing that and I'm thinking, yeah, I, I, I can go with that. That that sounds like a good story. Like, I'll just kind of go along with that and not say anything. And sounds pretty good. And, uh, you know, so, so literally like years and years went by and, you know, not, not that I thought about it all the time, but at times like that would come up and, um, you know, for the most part, I was pretty honest uh, growing up with, with my family and my parents. And uh, so that, that would eat at me at times that here I destroyed like my dad's, you know, one of his favorite things that he used all the time and like never like said anything about it. So, so I, I'm going to say I was in my earlier mid 20s when I finally said, OK, you know, enough of this, like I need to go and confess to my dad. Like, this is what really happened with his haystack all those years ago. And, and I told him, and, you know, again, here I was 10, 15 years feeling horrible about this. And, and he kind of laughed. He said, you, you know, that that haystack, you know, that I was shooting at, it was on its last leg. And, and I was so close to, like, getting ready to replace it. And I would have had to tear it all down and take it to the, the old one to the junkyard. And it would have cost me more money. Like, that thing burning down was probably the best thing that could have happened. And I just remember thinking like all these years, I thought this was such a terrible thing and I couldn't tell anybody. And, you know, it just caused like so much grief and, you know, come to find out, you know, my dad got his new archery range that he was about to put up anyway. Um, so, so, you know, a, a lot of times like holding on to that guilt just has no value and it's probably not as bad as you picture it or assume it to be. All right, so if somebody else was involved, you know, talk it out with them, um, you, you know, j just work it out where, you know, both of you can 
like confront it together and make amends together. And, uh, you know, the last question always to ask is, is your guilt productive or non-productive? And I, I've never heard somebody say, man, you know, I, I felt guilty for the last four years and it's so productive. I just love it. Right. It, it's always non-productive, but by following the steps above, you have the ability to make it productive. All right. So, so number three, you must learn to have compassion on yourself. And, and again, that, that's the hardest thing. But again, you know, Christ died on a cross for us. Um, so we don't have to live in this state of guilt and realizing we all make mistakes. So give yourself praise um, and, and build yourself up. You, you know, I, I'm the best at, you know, if, if I do nine things right, make one mistake. You know, when I dealt with this and suffered with this, that one mistake would eat me alive. And, I, and I'm not perfect, but I've gotten a lot better at giving myself that grace and forgiving myself. And, you know, again, we, we talked about this forgiveness issue before, but that unforgiveness is like drinking the sip of poison every day and expecting it to hurt the other person, which it's just not. And uh, when we refuse to forgive ourselves, you know, we're, we're playing the double part. <laughs> you know, not only the person who's full of unforgiveness, but the person who's not being forgiven. And uh, so, so, so really just make that part of your life of being able to, to learn from your mistakes, have compassion on yourself, and be willing to forgive yourself as well. So you can see all the great benefits of guilt. It's depressing, stagnating, keeps you trapped in the past, anger towards yourself, arrogance. It's a control issue. It allows avoidance, and it's an emotional ripoff. You get no benefit from it whatsoever. So in those blanks, I, you know, if, if there's anything now that you can think of that's been eating at you, that, that you've done wrong, and you know you need to either make amends, you need to forgive yourself, you need to have compassion on yourself, Again, you'll follow the steps up above based on whether it was done on purpose, done by mistake, and with other people. Um, but you can write in there, here's what's been eating me. You know, th th this is what I've done as an imperfect person and the mistake I made as we've all made and uh, what you're going to do about it. And uh, so, so you, you can do that now and pause the video. Or if you just want to, at the end of the video, go back and, and look at like, okay, here, here's what I feel bad about and here's what I'm going to do to change that. Right. So, so on page 30, uh, j just kind of following up on last week's worry. So again, worry is emotion that puts you in the past. A uh, research project was done that it shows 97% of the things that you worry about never actually happen to the extent that you were worried about it. All right. So, so you know, again, like 97% chance that what you're worrying about and what exactly is going to happen isn't going to happen and i know a lot a lot of what you you're thinking now is you know what what if it happens to be one of the three percent um what, one thing i can tell you beyond a doubt is if it happens to be one of those three percent of things and i'm sure if you evaluate all your worries from my, from your own history, like you're going to find that most of the stuff that you thought was going to happen and the extent that it would happen never actually happened. But if it is one of those 3%, there's still no benefit to it. So, so let's say that you're worried about getting cancer, right? And, and so you worry about that for that for 30 years, you know, pretty much every day that that's just a worry. It's always on your mind. And uh, so after 30 years, you finally go to the doctors, um, not finally go to the doctors, but you go to the doctor and the doctor says, hate to tell you this, but you have cancer. Um, so what, what, one thing I can promise you in that moment is you're not going to be sitting there in the doctor's office and say, boy, I'm so glad I worried about this for the last 30 years because that just made this moment so much better, right? Worry has no benefit. <laughs> like I said, even if it's one of those 3%, you, you're not going to be glad that you actually worried about it. Um, th then you can see some, some of the other thing. Um, you know, God doesn't want you to live that way. You know, in, in Philippians, he tells us not to be anxious about anything. So again, worry is picturing life. You don't want it the way you don't want to ha happen. Um, and, you, you know, one of the things, some worry is normal, right? So, so you have a very sick, sick child or, you, you know, you have, you have a parent in the ICU or a, a good friend that's been in a terrible accident, 
right? It, it, it would be more abnormal to say like, you know, whatever happens, happens. You know, I, I don't really think about it. I don't really worry about it. And, you know, so, so worry, some worry is normal. Um, but it's a chronic worry that tends to be the issue that plays into our anxiety, plays into our depression, and, and that we need to work through these things. Um, and so, so this next step is what we're going to do with our worry time. So you need to confront your worry. All right, so you're going to use some self-talk. So you got your worry jar, your worry container. Now, when you get to that worry time, number two is kind of like the, the second sub point there. So you're gonna start to switch from worry to action. All right, so, so let, let, let's say you're worried, you, you know, right now, it, today's the day after Christmas, it's December 26, 2020. It's been <laughs> a bad year as far as coronavirus has been around and, my request for people dealing with anxiety and worry has been off the charts for the last six months. Um, but, you, you know, for, for people right now worried about the virus, and you may be watching this a year later, 10 years later, 30 years later, who knows, and there may be totally different worries. Um, but, you know, as I'm working with these people that are worried about getting the virus and we get to this worry section, so, so during their worry time, you know, they pull that out of their jar and worry about getting the virus. So, so, so you start to, instead of just worrying about it, you start to plan for it. You know, not, not that the worry is going to happen, but you start to say, you know what, uh, I'm going to wash my hands for the 20 seconds like they recommend. I'm going to stay six feet, feet apart from everybody that I see at work on the street. I'm going to wear a mask. And, and, you know, me and my family, we're going to have a healthy diet. We're going to exercise. So if we do get the virus, it's probably not going to be that bad. Um, so, so you're actively planning, you know, I'm worried about getting the virus. Here's a few things that I can do to make my chances greatly reduced. And if it does happen, that, you, you know, most likely I'll recover fairly quickly from it. Or let's say, you know, you're worried about losing your job. So, so you know, there's going to be some layoffs, some cuts, the economy's going down, you, you know, just to say, okay, what, what can I do? Well, like show up to work early, you know, be productive, work hard, um, be a team player and, and ju just work your heart out. And what is, that? I think Colossians 323 says, whatever you do, work as though you're working for the Lord, not for men. So, you, you know, God, God's put you on a mission, you know, wh whether you're a janitor, whether you're a pastor, it doesn't matter what your career is, but just go and work it all your heart. Um, and, and then the second part during that worry time, there's certain things we can't control. So those are the things that you just got to give up to God. And, and you know what? In God's hands, they're way better than ours anyway. So, so you're just taking those things out of your worry jar and just saying, okay, this worry, what are the things that I can do? And actively doing them and planning for them. And the things that you have absolutely no control over, like give them to God. Um, you know, a lot of times people say, oh, you know, all my worries, like I have no control and I got to get, and I just <laughs> don't, don't agree with that. And I, I can, in a group settings, a lot of times, like we can brainstorm and come up with ideas. So a good example, like, like one worry that I have, like, you know, so, so I also work as a professional magician and I, I love to give shows where, you know, I can give a some type of message with it. My, my favorite shows are what's called Upward Sports. And so there's, youth programs all over the country that does basketball, soccer, flag football. And at the end of the season, they have this, they call it the year end celebration and they'll bring in an entertainer and a speaker. And uh, so, so, so their job is to give a gospel presentation and make sure everybody hears the good news about Jesus and that he loves them. He died on a cross for them and invite them to come into a personal relationship with them as we did back in the spiritual discipline exercise. So basketball is the most popular sport. Year-end celebrations tend to be late February, early March. And so as those approach, you know, I, I, I worry about the weather. You know, what, what if this gets canceled and it gets snowed out and I don't get to go and give the gospel? Um, and, you know, do I have any control over the weather? No, you know, unfortunately not. And, uh, but I, I do have control over if this event does get canceled, like the number one thing I want is for these families to hear the gospel. So, so there's some YouTube links I can send for them to, to send to their families. You know, there, there's a little 
show I could put together of, of the video that kind of gives a preview and, and, you know, hopefully it'll get them excited that I can come back the next season or, you know, a little book that I could recommend. Uh, there's a book called The Life Book. It's like the book of John with some handwritten notes in it that come from the Gideons that it is free. I mean, the Gideons take donations, but you, you can get these books for free and, and there, you know, give those out to the family, which, so, 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 so I'm saying, you know, whatever your worry is, you know, th th there's always little pieces you can do, but ultimately those upward shows and the weather, you know, I, I just have to give it to God and trust in his wisdom beyond mine. Um, so, so you want to be goalie core goal oriented question of validity of your thoughts you know, catch yourself when you're being negative and help yourself refocus. And again, just being um, action oriented and what you can do and start to picture life the way you want it to happen. Um, so you can see all those wonderful benefits of worry, which you can look through. Um, so, so there's a place there, you know, what your number one worry is, you know, so, so maybe it's the health of a child or a parent, something like that. Um, you know, a lot, a lot of times just because I've worked with so many kids, I know a lot of parents are worried about my kid. Like, you know, they're getting into trouble. They're doing all these things. Um, and, and you know what? I think the goal of parenting is to get a child, you know, when they're first born, they're 100 percent dependent on you. They can't feed themselves, change themselves, those sort of things. And then by the time they're 18 is getting that percentage to 100% on them, and hopefully they still need you, want you, and come to you for advice, uh, but that, that they can kind of manage on their own, and it's just through that journey of birth to 18, slowly giving them more and more of the percentage, you know, so, so by the time they get to 18, that they're going to have your wisdom and, like, like, have that in their background. You know, I, I like the verse Proverbs 22.6, that says train a child in the way they should go. And uh, when they grow old, they should not depart from it. And, and, you know, I've come across a lot of families that, you know, they'll, they'll bring a teenager to me. And, and, and I hear a lot, like, this is not the way that I brought them up. Like we were always, we, we prayed together. We, we went, to, you know, we were always encouraging and, and, you know, now, now they're on drugs or now they're doing this certain behavior or whatever. And I can tell you behind the scenes when, when I work with those teens or I work with those kids, like that prayer, that support, that background is, it, it's in there. Like it, it, it's, and I'm encouraging you, you know, if, if you're a parent, you know, the, the wisdom that you've given to your children, you know, the time that you've invested into them, like it's there. And, and um, you know, a lot of times it gets covered up by a lot of junk of peer pressure and things from the outside world. But when you peel away those layers, you know, what you train your child up in and what, what you give to them is there at the core of their being. And, you know, I, I think that's a promise from God and God's going to be faithful in that. But, you know, again, if you're worried about that, you're just making those plans like, like how, how can I share God's love with my child? How, how can I invest in them? How can I pray for them? And saying, here's the things that I can do action wise and the things that you don't, again, put them in God's hands and that's the best place for it. So keep up with that worry time. Um, as you look in the homework, that, that's going to be number one. I don't even think it's on the list, but um, make that worry time more productive and turn it into some action make amends and work through any guilt that you need to. And I want you to look back and review some of the lessons, some of the karate kid things I've been having you do and start to try and put all those pieces together. And there's a place for you to put like, here, here's the three things that are helping me the most right now. And here's the three things that I still need to work on. And you may see the things you need to work on, they still be coming up in our last set of lessons, or if it's something that we've already covered, Go back, watch the videos again. And again, we just want to put all these pieces into place and uh, to just, again, love to hear anything that's going on in your life, that God's doing in your life, ways this program's helping. So reach out to me anytime. And I look forward to seeing you in session 10.